<clears throat> 30 seconds. All right, hello all. Um, I'm sick today, so if I like stop talking and start coughing, that's why. Um, so my apologies. Okay, so today we're doing diversification. Okay. But first, some clicker questions. So remember channel one for Macro Revolution Fund. 41, yeah. Studying, hey. Oh, it's an easy question. Okay, one more, one more minute. Small class today. We're down like six people. You're gonna, you're gonna beat them on the curve. Alright. And done. And so most of you got it right. It's finches. Darwin's finches. Why do we care why do we care about them? Exactly. So there was one, you know, they, Darwin thought they were like different, entirely different groups of birds, but all very closely related. Um, and just from one finch, one, you know, or small set of finches that live in the islands and diversified in place. Okay. They're also interesting due to recent work by Peter and Rosemary Grant, who have gone and studied, and been studied them for every year for I think like 30 years and look at like ev actually evolution in action. So they're great for that too. All right, good. Next question. based on what we talked about in class a few, few days ago, um, but also just reading about the species. Give you one more, one more minute. <clears throat> All right. Survey says. So the answer is speciation. Why? Which can lead. We haven't, yeah, so we, they, we think it can, but we haven't, haven't shown that yet. Right. Exactly. exactly. So they can make so that males with one infection can't fertilize males with a different infection. So when they come back together, the reproductive will be isolated. Yeah, good. All right. All right. So today we're talking about diversification, right? So diversification is simply speciation minus extinction. Okay. Does it have to be positive? No, it doesn't. Um, you could have some groups where diversification is now negative, right? Um, they won't last very long, but if they have enough species to start with, they could, could, could exist. Okay. Um, 
And so bowers often have big questions about, about diversification, right? So if you look at flowers, right? Um, flowering plants, about 260,000 species of flowering plants. And their phylogeny is like this. Bunch of groups, and then sister to all of them is a single species. So that single species is called Amborella. Okay, so this looks weird, right? So at this point, we had two species, right? One, we wanted to create 260,000 species. One created one. Okay, now one's very close to zero. When you get to zero, you don't come back. Right? So it's, you know, has it been one throughout that time? Has it been, you know, 100,000 and back to one? Right? But also, why do we get this, you know, same amount of time, same, same basic states when they started? Why this great difference in, in diversity? Okay? So this, this sort of thing is something that puzzles biologists, okay? Something that we try to figure out the explanation for. Okay? <coughs> um, yeah, a Amborella. I think it's one of our key taxa. I that maybe a problem so far. Okay. It's found on one island in the Pacific Ocean. So, oh, okay. um, do we have it in the greenhouse here? No. It's not even in our greenhouse. That's how rare it is. Okay. <coughs> um, that one species. Okay. And so one thing people will often do is look at sister group comparisons, right? And this is one way of testing whether one group has, you know, whether a certain trait leads to more diversity. So here's an example of this research. Um, this is looking at latex canals. Okay. So think of like a milkweed, right? If you're a caterpillar and you go around like let's clear up this plant and start eating it, all of a sudden, white milky sap goes in your mouth, right? Tastes nasty, gums up the works, yucky, right? Some things have evolved to deal with that, right? But you can think, okay, it might lead to lower herbivory, because if you have a generalist herbivore, you know how to deal with this white milky stuff coming at you, right? Much better go to a dandelion, it's much easier to eat. Okay, um, okay so the question was, does this trait lead to higher diversification rates? And, no, they're not asking about speciation rates or extinction rates, just the net difference. Okay? And here's this study they've done. <coughs> so, this one has canals, or like, like, like it's canals, like conifer view, like Kelly view, right? and they compare it to their sister groups. Okay? And so this one has one species, this is group has 60 or 6. They don't have to this one or this one's system. Either way, the group has more. So their hypothesis is that it is canals cause increased diversification rate. Is it supporting that or not supporting that? Not supporting that. Okay. There's a negative. But every other case, supports it. Okay. So you do a little sign test and say, oh, yep, this is That makes sense? Any way of doing these comparisons? Okay. And no, all they're doing is looking at the number of species, not the speciation rate or extinction rate. Okay, separately. Okay. Here's another case. Um, looking at beetles. Are you comparing beetles that eat plants to beetles that eat other stuff? Okay. And the other stuff could be fungus, the other stuff could be um, in other insects, could be carnivorous beetles. Right? Um, and just doing such a comparison. Right, so, <coughs> serendipitous, we have 10,000 species, but the real, 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 Now, these sister comparisons just look at the sign, right? So, this counts as a positive test, right? Now, if it were, 79 or 78 is the positive test. Okay. So same with uh, statistical reports. OK. 
Okay. And so <coughs> there's also summarized. Okay. And the vector we're looking at 78 versus 25,000. Okay. So basically, they do five comparisons. Okay. Each of the five is positive in terms of, in terms of the hypothesis. And there's just barely enough to squeak out a p value less than 0.05. Boom! Science paper. Yay! Ten year at Harvard. Okay. Um, so he, he actually was my undergraduate advisor. It was cool. He asked to test ten year at Harvard. Um, not only to do this paper, but partly do this paper. Okay. So <coughs> you see how this is sort of a powerful way of doing science, figuring out what, what causes diversification. Okay. Questions about this? Okay. We talked about this before. What is this? Exponential growth, right? Why am I bringing it up here? Why might it, why might it be relevant? Anyone? Why, why might why might why, why might we care about exponential growth when talking about diversification of species? Species aren't bacteria. I don't know if they are, but in general, they're not, right? What process does this describe? This equation. Okay, what, what's not exponential growth? Give me an example of a process that's not exponential growth. Okay, linear growth. Okay, and so what happens there? No, yeah, steady line, right? Okay, so if we had linear growth, right? If I have ten species in one group and a thousand species in one group, right? They're growing linearly, but each have the same chance of having another species next time interval, right? Does that seem reasonable? No. Why? We think of all the processes that cause speciation, right? So mountains thrusting up, well, back if sweeping through, all these crazy things, right? Well, there's only 10, 10 chances left to happen. This has 10,000, right? You expect that the next one is speciate part of this one, right? You might expect that speciation, the, speci the next speciation might be proportional to the number of individuals, number of individuals you already have, the right? number of species you already have, okay? This is what this describes, right? So if I think about the classical case of exponential growth, like bacteria, right? I have one, and then it has two, right? Each of these can divide again, right? And so forth, right? Same thing with species. So the simple null model is that each species has a per species rate of speciation or extinction, right? And if that happens, then <coughs> and if, if the rate's positive, I get this sort of pattern, right? Now they don't they don't go at the same time. I mean, even even with the like, E. coli and broth, it's not that like okay, twenty four hours, boom, let's all divide, boom, let's all divide, right? It's you know one at a time, but the more I have, the more I keep producing. Right? Same thing with this. Okay, so this is our simple null model for speciation, okay? and this is used quite a lot in biology still. Now there's a problem with this model. Right, right. What, why, why not? Mm -hmm. Right, so one thing, this has a constant rate, e, right? Through life, it hasn't been a constant diversification rate? No. Big rock comes from outer space, it really tends to lower your speciation rate for a little while, right? Your net diversification rate. Um, you know, maybe your speciation rate is the same, but your extinction rate shoots way up. So that's that one pro problem. What's another problem with this? If we have even, okay, let's imagine we have a vat of E. coli. 
exponential growth, right? Do they can you that continue that forever? No. Why? Carrying capacitor, right? You can't go over a certain amount of individuals. Okay, or you can be, then you pull back down, right? And so at the beginning, logistic growth, and exponential growth looks similar, but then exponential growth, up and up and up, and up growth tapers off, right? Well, logistic growth has two parameters, R and K. This is one parameter, B. So this is a simpler model. And so, you think for species, you know, there is some maximum number of species on the planet. Are we there yet? We don't know. Okay. If we look through time at number of things like genera through time, we're at a, we're at a peak. It could also be that we can sample better now than we could with, you know, stuff trapped in fossil sediments in the past. Because of the astroherent bias. <coughs> okay. There's no reason to be cautious about this. Nonetheless, we can use this to get some interesting estimates. Let's go through and use this, and then we'll talk about other models that are more complex. So, here we have a group of silver swords. Okay. The silver swords are these cool plants. So, their, their sister group are California tar weeds, these little weeds grow on the side of the road. No one cares about them. Right? In Hawaii, we have this great diversification of these cool forms, and some of tree life, some of shrub life. Really, really neat diversity. Okay? Because it's radiation in Hawaii. And so, here we're look, they're looking at the number of species versus time. And it's on a log scale. Uh, excuse me, log scale. Okay. This is on a log scale. So it's on a log scale. So what do you see? It's positive, right? Good. What else? And we'll get back, I think it's important because we'll get back to that later because there's a bias caused by the fact that how we look at the trees that makes it always look positive. But we'll get back to it. Good. What else do we see? Right. If anything, is going up more, right? And remember, this is a log scale. So if I were to put this on a log scale, it would just be linear, right? It's exponential growth. And this sort of looks like that. Maybe you can go into this basket again. Yeah. OK, so maybe this is a good candidate for exponential growth. So then what do we want to do if we want to estimate the birth rate? OK. Well, so here's our equation. We put it into log space. We can think of it like a line, right? This, that's this axis, this, y equals mx plus b, right? Here's the next. It's a geometry. B is a slope. Right? Okay. So some of the things we start with two species versus phylogeny of two. Starting with the, the crown group, with two there, okay. And so now we can take this equation, and for a given point, well, we know what that is. We know what that is. We know what that is, right? So we just get b. Okay. So we can estimate the net diversification rate from this sort of properties looking at some point. Okay. So you have great, very simple math. Okay, so two people did this for many, many groups, okay, and so all you did was take each group, the number of species you had, and the age, okay, so I think it's the crown age started with two species, they have to have two species, so it's two species, we know how many species they got to, we know how much time it took, we really estimate the birth rate. For these, all these different groups. Right? <coughs> and here's their estimates. So it is from the whole at this rate. Right? Whereas um, other groups, like some of the people that might not pay is, so the whole group is from the high rate. But different components of them might have smaller rates, and some will have higher rates too. So you don't see in this plot uh, orchids, which have a high rate. Okay. Any questions about this procedure? 
Maybe it just has very simple math, but something that looks at looking at different diversification rates for different groups, very easily compare them. Okay. And you can plot them. Okay. So here's the age of the clay that we're looking at, the clades. It's with our wild living friends. Okay. And then we can look at how many pieces there are. Okay. And then we can get close to that big So we can find outliers here. Right. So here's sort of our 95% CI, right? These have a higher rate than you expect. These have a lower rate than you expect. Okay? So you can go and say, okay, why are these losers? Why are these losers? Uh, start making hypotheses and you can go and test it. So I think that, oh, well, what it is is these are B pollinated and these are pollinated by the wind. So that my discovery. I can then go and test it groups and make, make a testable prediction and then go into it in more detail. Okay? I do macro evolution. Yeah? Diversification rate. Yeah. Um, and typically with this sort of analysis, what you do is you assume that your birth rate equals your diversification rate, so you assume you have zero extinction. This is called the Yule model. Um, but actually they didn't know like, where they didn't have to assume that. So the, the, on this plot, I showed you this column, they have another column here where the completion rate is much higher. And that matters, okay? So, back to our ascertainment bias example of the dolphins and the sailors, right? So, <coughs> we only see those clades that survived, right? So, the fact that you saw it means that, you know, it starts off with just two individuals, two species, right? Let's imagine the speciation rate and extinction rate are about equal. Right? Well, it has a good chance of it going to zero species as to going to four species. Right? Well, if it goes to zero species, you don't see it. It's not in your analysis. If it goes to four, you might. Okay? So this is just a bias. You tend to see, tend to see groups that diversify quickly early. Okay? Because those are the ones that happen to survive to be observed. Okay? And so they actually have equations to deal with that ascertainment bias. They're really important. That later work actually sort of ignores, which is something that we're trying to fix. Yeah, good question. Other questions about this? Okay. Another thing this tends to show, so do you see a lot of correlation with number of species and age? This plot? Not really, right? Oh yeah, of course. And so, what might that show? Mm -hmm. Right. So it could mean it could be an example of saying maybe this maybe it is actually logistic growth. So maybe each one has a different K. That's one hypothesis people have advanced. What else could it be? Mm -hmm. So a different, a different rate, but due to just where you live rather than an intrinsic factor. Good. What else? Something you should always think about when you're looking at this sort of stuff. Oh, good. I wasn't going for that, but yes, exactly. It's, a better, it's even better than what I was going to think of. Yeah, so you have to control for relatedness, right? So they don't. So these are all um, in various ways. It could be that, um, you know, uh, Four unit plots and other unit plots have a similar rate, but they're all interrelated. Good. What else? What do you see on this plot? You'd like to see on plots of like this, scatter plots. Error bars. Okay. Do we know exactly the age and families is 121.000530 in the years? How about number of species? Have we counted? Yep, there are 100,000 exactly in the Nope, they're going that way too. Okay. And so it could be that there's a, a correlation, but the noise in our sample obscures it too. I guess another thing we're always worried about. Yeah, good.
Okay, so here we have a link through time curve. Okay, which sounds all fancy, but all it is is you go through and count up how many things are alive in each point. Right? So here I have one thing alive, one. Here I have one, two, three things alive, three. Okay, and you got them from the growth of this curve. Right, so it's exponential growth, what do you expect on the log scale? Link through time curve. I expect to be linear right, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a log scale. Like the more bacteria in the broth. Okay. Um, the problem is, we don't see, you know, there's three species here. Because we live out here, it's present. Okay. We typically only see those layers that are persistent in the present. Okay. And so we see this much lower curve here, okay. which at the present converges. But through here, it's more. We miss all the other ones that we don't see. Okay. It also means if a group has been sort of constant number of species through time, right? So imagine we have sort of five species, and one goes extinct, and one shakes, and so forth in time, so we're just a growth. If we look at the plot, all we see is an increase. So you do some bias towards seeing increases. Okay. <coughs> What's the problem? It's actually also a solution. Okay. So our net sort of slope gives us a diversification of Earth minus death. Okay. Our net rate. Okay. We view information about it goes off this way, but or actually. These are we can take a curve and use it to survive. Okay? We can do something about how it could be it feels like the present, that's our point aspect for the birth rate. Okay? If we have birth rate, the vegetation that goes us to make death rate here. Okay. Um <coughs> and so we can then tell from a linear time plot diversification rate, birth rate, and death rate. Okay? However, We have all this line to measure the vegetation rate, right? We have to make birth rate just by this thing right up here. Okay. Did we do a good job of it? I can change it like, quite a lot without a lot of data. Okay. So birth rates and death rates separately are estimated pretty poorly. Okay. But natural vegetation rate can be estimated well. So let's look at some of these curves. Okay. So here I've done a simulation with the ones have this birth rate and this death rate. The ones have this birth rate and this death rate. We know about the diversification rate for each curve. What's that diversification rate for the top one, the blue ones? We have 0.1 you know, species per million years. How about the bottom one? 0.1, right? The same diversification rate, right? but different birth rates and death rates, and different turnover rates, right? Same distribution rates are really quickly. Right? Take a lot more time. Right? So we call that turnover rate, the sum of those. If you're a species, how long until something happens to you? You species or go extinct? Well, it's some of those rates. Okay. Any sense? No? Yeah, what's your argument? Um, okay. It's worth, it's worth getting this because this is useful. 
necessarily. It applies to lots of arrays of algebra, not just this. All right, so have a particle, right? So something. What could happen to it next? Well, in this case, I have birth or death, right? And so it's like a Poisson process, if that helps people, which probably wouldn't. Um, that's what she was saying. <laughs> It's, it's French for fish. Doesn't end up with that. So I can have either it, you know, die or species. Okay. It's based on some rate for each. Okay. And so the wait time for Poisson process is exponentially distributed. Right. So here is the probability of waiting for a certain amount of time. Okay. Um, so it's like, how long until a light bulb burns out? Okay. Um, there's a certain amount of time. It could happen right away, or it could, you could wait <coughs> 10 years. Right? It declines your time. Right? Now, the, total, the overall life of the light bulb, you know, its average is lower. And of course, this assumes that you know, it's a constant rate through time. Of course, you know it's not. Um, same thing for the other. I'm thinking of other good pro examples of Poisson processes um, or things with exponential waiting times. Accidents in the highway are one. Right, so if you have, you know, how soon until some traffic camera sees, a, sees an accident at that place? Nothing's happening all the time in different places, and you have to wait until what happens right there. Okay. Um, and so for this, the wait time for ha this happening is just your birth rate. It's your birth rate. Okay. And for this happens your death rate. Okay. So it could be easy to think about it in discrete time. Right. So imagine we have, you know, in every time interval, there is one birth rate and one death rate. So the probability of a birth is B, so the probability of a death is D, so the probability of no birth and no death. So one of the probability of birth, one of the probability of death. Right? Okay. See? And you assume that you can't do both, but you know, at, at a tiny time, you, know, you can't do both. Okay? So you go to be born or have a, have a speciation event or a death event, right? So probably one of those happening is probably either, some, the sum of the probably of either of those happening, right? If we assume that it's small the only one can happen. Okay, that makes sense? Yeah. Um, we have the same sort of models we think about how DNA evolves, right? So we have a bunch of A's, how long until we change one into a T, right? Well, it's, the, it's the rate of A to T. It's based on the rate of A from A to T. How long until we change it from A to T, C, or G? Well, it's the sum of going from A to, A to T plus A to T, G plus A to C. Yeah? Uh, here? Yeah. Because I made it so. So it could be, so one thing I'm doing badly here is I'm not showing you so this could be, so you're thinking about, so if we're discrete time, you know, probably a sense of once per time interval, that's huge. It could be once per million years or once per 10 million years, something like that. Good. And this is what I think about, we often ignore rates for this sort of stuff, but they all have to get there. They have rates. You can go for For numbers. Okay. okay. Units. Other questions? Okay. <coughs> and so the red one is shooting up faster. But you don't see the ones that are shooting to zero. Right? So they only so to get 20 lines, they've had to submit at least 25 times and then 60 times. Well, you don't see the ones that shot up, we went that far. And this just shows that, right? So <coughs> in all these points. My birth rate equals point one times plus my death rate. Right, so my natural education rate is the same. Right, birth minus death is always point one in this case. Right, but the probability going extinct starts off being zero and the rate zero. 
and shoots up to you know, six or seven. So he's going to hide. And so, in past times around the class, I've had you, I have had students go through and do simulations themselves. I think the overhead of getting everyone's laptop set up is not worth it, so I'll show you here. Okay. So basically, I'm using this very simple function. Okay. I'm just simulating a phylogeny and then plotting it. Okay. With various error checking for to prevent to protect against students messing up, right, entering crazy values and stuff like that. But mostly, just say, okay, speciate and go extinct at some rate. Okay. And I can do that. Okay, and generate this plot, right? So here's my lineage to the time plot. Looks kind of weird, right? Why is it? Well, yeah, there's species. Okay. Now I'm going to use the same exact parameters, and not changing anything, and simulate again. Whoa! Right? Now I have 10 species. So for 4 versus 10, it seems like a big difference, right? This is exactly the same parameters. So they have the same birth rate, same death rate. Same turnover, same diversification rate, of course. They're very different outcomes. Right? And look, right here, it looks like, you know, like one species up to four almost instantaneously. Right? It would be very hard to resolve the phylogeny. Right? But this one is just based on the same birth rate, birth death rates. Nothing nothing is this faster here than like that. Same rate throughout. Okay. I'll do it again. Whoa, now I have twenty species. Right? <coughs> okay, I'll do it again. Okay, now only 10 again. 11. 12. Actually. Okay. And we see the 50 species. So these are all using the same parameters. Okay. But getting very different results. What do you think about this? It doesn't seem very useful. <laughs> Why do you say that? It's such a big window. Right, so we see these same parameters have a lot of, can result in many different outcomes, right? And so <coughs> we are that you might have a big you know, error bar to estimates, right? So it's good, it's good to be careful about this for this reason. Yep. Um, other thoughts? What we do in practice, actually, is we, you know, we'll fit, say, a model that has birth and death rates, a model that has just birth rates, and see if it's worth using the more complex model. And we also can get our estimates of birth rates and figure out, you know, what, what the error bars are and say, okay, this, this tree has, you know, this might be birds, might have this birth rate, and lizards might have this birth rate. So, yeah, there's huge error bars, but birds are winning. But it's very important to think about the error bars. It's good. Other thoughts? Okay. What will, have, what will happen if I have a very high death rate? So right now my parameters are, by default, death rate is half birth rate. All right. Let's let's make it so that my death rate is 0.9. What's going to happen? What do you expect? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. Okay, good. Do it again. So they're getting fewer species on average, right? Okay. And that's because my net. Here's two species. Mm. Okay. Is because my net diversification rate is a lot lower, right? Rather than being um, one minus 0.5, it's now one minus 0.9. Right, so it's one fourth the diversification rate. Okay. And what I'm not showing you is all the ones that are going extinct, right? So this this one, I simulated eight times. This is the only one that actually survived to the present. Okay. 
do it again. This one has to do it 13 times to get this straight. So all the ones that have fewer species of going through the, well, all the ones that hit zero at some point in their history, you don't see. Because again, ascertainment bias is a big deal. Questions about this? Okay. Anyway, this is on my website, so if you want to download it and play with it yourself, you may. And then we'll give you warnings if you enter bad values and stuff, so you can play with it. It won't break your computer. Okay. <coughs> Alright. So, another uh, topic in this area is adaptive radiation. Okay? And so, adaptive radiation is when you have both an in in a high diversification rate and also evolution to different niches. Okay? Um, and that's a definition from Schluter, who's one of the people working on this. Okay? Um, other people have different definitions, and it's sort of a sexy term. So, if you can say, oh, microbes are going into adaptive radiation. People pay more attention to it, so it's used sloppily. But the technical definition that people tend, tend to agree on is a high diversification rate and evolution of different niches. Okay, so the classic example of that is Greer and Tilly's Anolis. Okay, where they have evolved you know, different morphs that deal with living on kind of grass stems versus living on tree trunks. Okay, and that gets you, you know, hunting prey on each of these areas. Okay. And the cool thing about this story is that they've evolved the same morphs <coughs> independently in different, different islands. Right? So is evolution repeatable? In this case, yes. Okay. Okay. Here we have another case of retrogradation of cichlids. Okay. So many fish have actually two sets of jaws. The ones you see, and the ones further back in their throat, okay, called pharyngeal jaws. Um, and with cichlids, they've evolved a new muscle attachment for those throat jaws, that allows them to move them independently and do stuff with them. And so now they can evolve separately and have, um, so an, increase, an example of an increase in flexibility and evolution leading to irradiation. So now they can have one set of jaws used for picking up snails, and the back set of jaws used for crushing snails. Okay? Or for prey capture and prey shredding. Okay? Um, actually, moray eels, which you've you know, you probably have seen, found out, I think it was five years ago, they can actually take their pharyngeal jaws and shoot them out, out of their mouth. So like the, the creature from Alien, you know, <laughs> more eels can do that too with their pharyngeal jaws. It's a really cool um, example of you know, evolution. Okay. <coughs> and so cichlids are a great example where you have this, I'll show you a video later in class, not, not today, um, where you have this rapid radiation of different morphs. And so we have, there are cichlids that are uh, fish eaters, there are cichlids that are algae eaters, there are some that are specialized to swim with fish and bite the side of it and get some scales and swim off. And there's both, there both lefties and righties for that. Okay. There are some that look like decaying fish and sort of float on the floor. And then when something comes, they look ah, and get them. Okay. So really cool adaptive radiation. <coughs> and so here's a possible model for how things um, go through adaptive radiation. Right? So we have some key innovation of the cichlids that new muscle attachment, okay, or new habitat of the lizards, okay, variation um, natural selection, okay, keep those released, make it more new areas of phenotype space, okay, and then somehow we have initiation from those other patients, or what we don't mention here, the new extinction rate, that can be too, 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 okay, and this mechanism is still staying Okay. So sort of thing of, you know, why does having a good trait, you know, being able to be like, have alien jaws lead to more speciation or extinction? Okay? The more speciation rate, maybe you can get to new niches and have, you know, there's divergence that way. Maybe it just lowers your extinction rate. That's something that people are actually still looking at. Okay? Well, the problem with this is we can measure diversification rate well, right? But it's hard to separate, separately estimate speciation or extinction rate. So you might say, okay, I think the anolis on the Antilles have a much lower extinction rate than other anolis. You find out the extinction rate is estimated as this for those and this for those. So maybe with these huge error bars, it's hard to get at. Okay, um, we're running short on time, so I'll skip this part. Um, this shows sort of the age of some of the depth of radiation you think about. So the are here. Well, 
and this is looking at various, and the bars show various uh, sequence yeah, the limits. Okay, let's get that. Um, <coughs> so the, here are our linear through time plots, right? So constant birth depth, low depth, okay? If we have a high depth, we have this uptick right at the end. If we have the rate right change at one point, we get this sort of curve, right? Increases the sort of curve, okay? And then we have density dependence, right? We get some sort of carrying capacity up here. We have more com more complex things like constant new mass extinction. Okay. And so by fitting these from curves, we can estimate seeing what processes are going on. Okay. Um, let's skip this one. All right. <coughs> and so here are different models where we have so different ways of doing density dependence okay, for diversification rates. So here's the diversification rate through time. You can do base rate, and you can modify the base rate. Okay, so here's our photo register graph. Okay. And so we can fit these, fit these different equations and then compare the models and see which model fits best. When we find a model that has a moderate K, we go, oh, the logistic growth here is not exponential growth. Okay. So we can actually test these macroevolutionary theories. So here's one, okay, where basically this is a measure showing you how much information you're losing. So we're going to lose the leaflet of information. We're going to lose the leaflet of information about life. And this one. So the density dependent model with exponential growth fits better than linear or pure growth. Okay. So we tell something about, you know, there might be density dependence here. Okay. Um, we'll get to this later. Um, here's just an example. So here's our identification from this axis. Okay. And here's our extinction rate. Okay. And you see, so these are sort of confidence, these are uh, contrary up or something like confidence intervals. Okay. And so everything within this negative 2 is about the equal. And so we see a pretty narrow range on this axis. It's pretty big on this axis. As you get further out, you know, this is still pretty narrow, but on this axis, you can show it off. And so, essentially, it's hard to estimate. Okay. In this paper, what they do is estimate net diversification rates. We looked at this from the previous class. So all these different groups have found out where rates are highest, like in terms of birth, and low as like health. And finally, <coughs> um, here's, a, here's an analysis uh, from paper with a nice title. Extinction rates should not be estimated to look at phylogenies, okay? By someone whose career is based on estimating extinction rates from look at phylogenies, okay? So when someone like that says, you shouldn't do this anymore, guys, stop, 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 to pay attention, right? And then we can go to keep doing it. Anyway. Uh, <coughs> There's going to be cautious about these methods, and here's one reason why. Okay? So if you simulate a case where you have speciation or extinction, you have, then you have some variations as you go through time, okay? but at a constant rate. Okay? And if this rate was truly zero, truly 0.5, truly 0.95. Okay? And then if you have no variation, you have to get it left. Right? So there are estimates say that. You have zero, truly 0.5, truly 0.95, truly if this has a little bit, we start having some variation. We start either picking zero or one for the rate. Okay. At this point, even though these all have very different true extinction rates, you know, from zero to point nine five, our estimates, you know, this says zero two thirds of the time and one third of the time. It says zero about half the time, but about half the time. Right. They don't get the right answer. Okay. So in the case of our estimates being really, really bad. Right? So you can copy that. Right? Like I guess in biology, be, be cautious, but here's one case where these parameters are actually very hard to estimate. Right, any questions about this? Okay, good. I'll see you on Wednesday.